Hello everyone, Foxy here, and welcome to Mostly Mental. Today, I'd like to continue my series on combinatorics with a discussion of one of my favorite topics, permutations. We talked a bit about permutations a few videos back, but to recap, a permutation is an arrangement of a collection of objects into an order. So, you might imagine shuffling a deck of cards, or arranging the numbers 1 through n. And, for example, if we have the numbers 1 through 6 here, we might shuffle them to get 2, 6, 4, 3, 5, 1. And, as we saw last time, there are n factorial such permutations. There are a few natural ways to represent a permutation, but the one we'll find most useful today is what's known as cycle notation. So we'll write the numbers 1 through 6, and we'll connect them based on which numbers get replaced with which others. So here, 1 gets replaced with 2, 2 gets replaced with 6, 3 gets replaced with 4, 4 gets replaced with 3, 5 gets replaced with 5, and 6 gets replaced with 1. If we were to write that in cycle notation, we would say 1 gets replaced with 2, gets replaced with 6, gets replaced with 1, which we write 1, 2, 6 in parentheses, and then we have 3, 4, and finally we have 5 in its own cycle. There's actually a bit of leeway in this cycle description. After all, there's no reason we had to start this first cycle with the 1. We could just as well have started it with the 2 to get 2, 6, 1. Or we could have started our representation with another cycle, say this one. Or we could take our cycles and put them in the opposite order, which gives us 5, 3, 4, 1, 2, 6. And these are all representing the same permutation. And multiple representations make everything trickier, so it would be nice if there was some way to choose a best representation for each permutation. To do so, we'll say that you always put the smallest number in each cycle first. So something like this, where the 1 comes at the end, is out. We'll also say that, given that, we'll order our cycles such that the one with the largest first element comes first. So that will make this our canonical representation. And if, for example, we had a permutation of the numbers 1 through 9, given by 3, 8, 2, 6, 1, 4, 9, 7, 5, we would get a canonical order of 5, 7, 4, 9, 2, 6, 3, 8, 1. Well, that's a strange order. Why would we choose that? Well, it has the nice property that the parentheses are redundant. So what that means, if we were given this without the parentheses in it, so 5, 7, 4, 9, 2, 6, 3, 8, 1, we could put the parentheses back in. To do so, we'll group numbers into a cycle until we find one that's less than the first. So we start by grouping 5 and 7, but then 4 is less than 5, so that's the end of our cycle. And then we'll group 4 and 9 but 2 is smaller, so that ends that cycle. And then this gives us 2, 6, 3, 8, and 1 is on its own. And that gives us the same grouping that we had here. Armed with this canonical representation, we can start to answer some interesting questions. For instance, if we choose a random permutation, how likely is it that two given elements end up in the same cycle? Well, our answer shouldn't depend on which two elements we're looking at, so we may as well look at elements 1 and 2. 
how likely is it that 1 and 2 end up in the same cycle? In our canonical order, the numbers in the same cycle as 1 are the ones that come after 1, and anything that comes before is going to be in a different cycle. So our question becomes, how likely is it that 2 comes after 1? For any given order, there's another order where we swap the 1 and the 2, and so there must be equally many permutations where the 1 comes before the 2 as there are where the 2 comes before the 1. And so that means there's a 50% chance that the 2 comes after the 1 and is thus in the same cycle as the 1. So a 50% chance that 1 and 2 are in the same cycle. And once again, there's nothing special about 1 and 2, so for any two elements, there's a 50% chance they're in the same cycle. Let's try another question. If we choose a random permutation, what size cycle is any given element most likely to end up in? It's not intuitively obvious. On the one hand, we're going to have a lot more small cycles, but on the other hand, each large cycle has more elements in it. But with our canonical representation, it's not too hard to work it out. Once again, our answer shouldn't depend on which element we're looking at, so we may as well look at 1. And the size of the cycle containing 1 is just going to be the number of elements after and including the 1. And 1 is equally likely to end up in any position, so the size of the cycle containing 1 is equally likely to be anything from 1 through n. So, every possible size of cycle is equally likely. We can get another interesting insight by looking at cycles of even length. We'll call a permutation even if it has an even number of them, and odd otherwise. For instance, that permutation we saw back at the beginning, 264351, which has cycle representation 126, 34, 5, has one cycle of even length, so we call it an odd permutation. What happens if we swap the positions of two of the elements? Well, if they're in the same cycle, like 1 and 2, we get 1, 6, 4, 3, 5, 2, which has cycle representation 1, 2, 6, 3, 4, 5. And notice that we've taken this cycle and broken it into two, and left all of the other cycles unchanged. Okay, how about if we swap two that are in different cycles, like one and four? Well, then we get two, six, one, three, five, four, which has cycle representation one, two, six, four, three, five. And here, we've taken these two cycles and merged them together. But in both of these cases, notice that we've ended up with an even permutation. So here we've got two even cycles, and here we've got none. And in general, we will always change the number of cycles of even length by exactly one which means that we're always going to go from an odd permutation to an even permutation, or vice versa. So far, we've been thinking of permutations as collections of cycles, but we could also see them as sequences of swaps. So to get from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, to 2, 6, 4, 3, 5, 1, we could first swap the 1 and the 2, and then swap the 1 and the 6, and then swap the 3 and the 4 to get from one to the other. And this takes us three swaps. But we could also do this a bunch of other ways. For instance, we could swap the 1 and the 2 and then the 1 and the 3, and then 1 and 4, 1 and 5, 1 and 6, to move the 1 from 
one end to the other, and then do the same thing for each of the other elements. Swap it one place at a time to get it from its starting position to its ending position. And if we do it that way, it's going to take us nine swaps. And notice, three and nine are both odd. In fact, they have to be, since we're starting at an even permutation and ending at an odd one. And every swap alternates between even and odd. So any sequence of swaps that takes us from one to the other is going to have an odd length. Thinking in terms of even and odd permutations leads to some very interesting results in group theory. Look up the alternating group if you're curious. But that strays a bit too far into algebra for my taste, so I'll leave it at that for now. There's one other type of permutation that I'd like to talk about in a bit more depth. What happens if you add the requirement that no element that gets mapped to itself? That is, there are no cycles of length 1 like this. We call such permutations derangements, which is absolutely my favorite name. Next time, we're going to explore the combinatorics of derangements. Thank you for watching. I hope to see you again soon.